Good to see you this morning. Good to have those of you joining us uh, online. If you're a guest this morning, we're certainly thankful for your presence, whether you're here in the venue or online. We're so glad that you have joined us. We we'll encourage you to connect with us. Uh, you can do that a couple of ways. One is you can stop by our Connection Center in the lobby on your way out this morning, or you can just text the word CONNECT to 94000. We've had a lot of trouble with that number. I don't know if you've noticed that. Some of our guys don't know it's 94,000. Um, I suggested just say 94 and a trinity of zeros, but they were worried you might not know what a trinity was. So 94000 is that number. Well, we're in a series on neighboring. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the Good Samaritan and, and recognized from the Good Samaritan that a neighbor is basically any person in need. That could be a coworker, uh, that could be a total stranger. You could be in the grocery store checkout line and see a single mom who can't afford the, uh, the groceries for her children and you might help her. That could be a, a person in another country, specifically if you go on uh, mission trips. There are a lot of people that you have opportunity to neighbor when you're in other countries. But the, the issue for most of us about neighboring is that if we're not careful, we want to overlook the people that are physical neighbors, the people that live next to us or live uh, around us. And they're not lesser neighbors. The reason you overlook them is it's much easier to uh, neighbor someone you don't have to live around or get involved with. It's difficult to neighbor those that we live around, our physical neighbors. That can become a quagmire. It can get uh, quite messy. Uh, we can't just uh, get away from those people. They're right there all the time. But we recognize that living out the great commandment. You understand the great commission from Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all the nations. The great commandment. First commandment is what? Love God and the second like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the first step. As we live out the great commandment, it's the first step to fulfilling or accomplishing the great commission, which is what we're called to as the church. And that doesn't mean it's a corporate calling and responsibility. It's not up to the leaders of the church. It means the church, the body of Christ, Every individual neighbor has that calling. Well, it's been fun over the last two weeks and, and also challenging to hear uh, from several of you who've gotten out of your comfort zone. You, you've met some neighbors uh, that you had not known before. Others of you have shared some very specific plans. You're, you're taking action to deepen your connection with your neighbors. Let me just share one story. Um, this is one of, of many and I'm going to go ahead and say the name because she doesn't care. Pam Cummings. Pam is a high school teacher at Benton High School. She lives in Bryant. Uh, Pam, four years ago, when we first talked about neighboring, really got into it. Did a lot of very significant things in, in her neighborhood. But like any of us, over the last four years, that's kind of waned a little bit. Well, Pam knew we were about to go there again, and so she really amped up her game. And uh, she really made a commitment to really um, work more on those connections. And what Pam did uh, just recently was she came up with this idea of getting a gift bag and putting some things in it, just a surprise, an anonymous thing. And she would leave that gift bag on her neighbor's doorstep or, or on the door with a note in it that simply said, you've been neighbored. Didn't say who it was from. But in that gift bag, she also left an instruction card and some blue ribbons. And when you get neighbored, you tie a blue ribbon on your mailbox because there are about 45 or 50 houses on the loop where Pam lives. So you tie a blue ribbon on your mailbox, and then you neighbor someone else, give them the instructions, give them the gift, the instructions of blue ribbon. Pam walked her, uh, her loop last week, and there are now eight blue ribbons on display on that loop. So she has uh, kind of started that process of helping people understand the importance of being neighbors and, and being good neighbors. I'd love to hear about what you're doing, um, what you, uh, neighbors you have met, steps you have taken. Most of our staff have sent me different reports of what they're doing as neighbors. Love to hear from you if you would email me and let me know how that's working for you. And let me just, um, let me be accountable. My accountability for this next week uh, most of you know I live in a kind of rural area. My two closest neighbors, um, um, they're believers. In fact, they go to church here. Um, the dads, a little bit questionable. I wouldn't mention Donovan and Tyler's names because I don't want them moving away uh, because of anything that I said. But I do have some neighbors around me who don't know the Lord. And uh, this next week, hopefully I'll do this before Saturday night when I realize I made this commitment publicly. This next week... I'm going to go, we live on a little gravel, one-lane drive. I'm going to go across to some neighbors over there that have some kids and down the main street a couple of doors and, and meet some new folks and let them know who we are and that we're there and that we care for them. 
Well, this morning, let's take a few minutes and talk about probably the biggest obstacle to neighboring, our, our time, and specifically how we prioritize our time um, for the things that are important to us. Now, you may begin to sense as we're walking through this series some conviction about neighboring, but you probably initially are going to ask the question, how am I going to have time for that? My life is already uh, incredibly full, and, and you're asking me to develop relationships with four or five or, or six new people. Well, first of all, the reality is not all of your neighbors are going to respond the same. You're probably going to reach out to four or five, six people, but maybe have one or two that you can develop a relationship with. But the problem many of us have is we're maxed out, and we don't have any margin. And there are, there are a couple of lies that we tell ourselves. Here's the first one. You ever told yourself this lie? Someday things will settle down. Can I get some people over 80 to tell everybody else things don't settle down? <laughs> they get a little less hectic. The other lie that we tell ourselves is, well, everybody lives this way. Everybody lives a hectic, chaotic life, hectic pace, barely skimming the surface. Well, that's, that's just not true. At least it doesn't have to be true. When we operate at the pace that most of us operate at, we miss some pretty important things of life because of our hurry, or because of our frantic pace, or because of our concept or idea that we need to be busy. Listen, not busy is not necessarily the same as being lazy. Now, there's some not busy people that are just lazy, but not busy doesn't always mean lazy. Sometimes we have to cut back on the busyness in order to really have priority and time for the things that are important. John Ortberg, in his, in his book, The Life You've Always Wanted, talks about hurry sickness. Most of us are inflicted with hurry sickness, and that's the enemy of our spiritual life, and that's the enemy of growth. That's the enemy of us accomplishing what God has called us to. Love and hurry are not compatible. If you think they are men, you just try to be in a hurry celebrating your wife today because you've got to get to the golf course or something. Try that. Let me know how that works out. Love and hurry are not compatible, and, and hurried and busy people typically don't have time for relationship with God or with their neighbor. Let's look at a little snapshot this morning from Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 38 through 42. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the Good Samaritan. This is right after the passage we looked at two weeks ago, the Good Samaritan. And it says in verse 48, now as they went on their way, as Jesus and the disciples traveled on from that encounter with the teacher who wanted to know, who is my neighbor? As they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord... Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Well, what's happening here? Martha is very distracted. She, she's prepping things. She's busy getting the home ready, opening her home, preparing a meal. So she's rushing around. She's hurried and she's harried. And in her busyness, she misses being with Jesus. And you notice he says, that's the main thing. That's the one thing that is necessary. Now, Martha's not doing anything bad. She's not acting in some kind of evil way here. It's good. It was good that she invited Jesus in. It was good that she wanted to care for him and, and, and his needs. So, so why the reprimand from Jesus? Well, understand that the reprimand is because we want to do for him. He wants us to be with him. Is doing for him a good thing? Absolutely. It's a good thing that many people in our body want to do for him because they help serve, they help minister, they help lead. But doing for him is not important, doing for him is not valuable, doing for him is not effective unless we have first been with him. And to do that, sometimes we have to say no to what is good to do what is best. What about Mary? Mary, it says, was sitting at his feet, listening. Not, not only did she do the best thing, but I want you to understand that Mary went against the cultural norms of her day. 
For a woman to, to sit at his feet was not normal. When, when a rabbi, when a teacher came to town, those who were sitting at his feet were those who were, were students. There was a student-teacher relationship. Well, women were not students. Women were not disciples in this day. Sorry, ladies, but a woman's place was in the kitchen. Not on Mother's Day, men. We clear? A woman's place was in the kitchen. Her worth was based on how gifted she was as a hostess. But Mary broke those cultural norms, and she centered on the main thing. Now, you're, you're probably wondering, where are you going with this? This experience here in Luke 10 doesn't specifically speak to neighboring, but it reminds us of the importance of prioritizing and doing what is important and what is necessary spiritually. That's what you see in Mary's life. It, it speaks of the priority of time with Jesus and in his presence. And I would say to you from that, before we try to neighbor, we need to be filled up from time with Jesus. As we spend time with him, it helps fulfill our calling to neighbor. Because Mary made the decision to spend time with Jesus, she experienced the benefit of his presence. When we take time to be in his presence, it affects our purpose and it affects our practice. Why is that? We spend time in Jesus' presence, what are we reminded of? We're reminded of the incredible love he had, that he was willing to die for us. We're reminded that he's called us and we have a purpose in our calling. Paul in Ephesians 2.10, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance before we were even born. God prepared those things for us to do. We have a purpose. We're reminded and challenged when we spend time with Jesus of our calling to love others and to share the gospel in some very practical ways. What happens when we spend time with Jesus is that his heart becomes our heart. The things that are important to him, the things that are priority to him become priority to us, become important to us. And so we really get a sense when Jesus said, out of Deuteronomy, the most important thing is to love God first and then love your neighbor. We get a sense of that and we understand that calling on our lives. So this little snapshot here in Luke 10 of, of Mary and, and Martha's encounter with Jesus speaks to the importance of priorities and, and how we use our time. And it also speaks to our need for his presence. If we're going to focus on the great commandment as a priority, we've got to create margin in our lives. We've got to go against cultural norms. You know, it's not a cultural norm anymore. It used to be. It's not a cultural norm anymore to be present in your neighborhood. What happens in most neighborhoods? There's this little button we have in the car. It might be on a remote that's clipped on the visor. It might be programmed into the car, but this little button that keeps us from neighboring. You know what I'm talking about? And you hit it as you're coming down the street. Man, mine, I can hit from three blocks away. I, I try farther and farther to see if the, the garage are. You hit the button and you pull in and then what do you do? You hit the button again, right? It's not culturally normal to be present in your neighborhood. I told you two weeks ago about my friend Stephen who pulled his grill out to the front yard. That raised some eyebrows in his neighborhood initially. And then people started coming out and hanging out because his family and their kids were in the front yard. I had lunch this week with a, with a friend here from church, a leader in our church, and he said, you know, I realized um, I'm in my front yard. My kids are playing in the front yard, so I'm sitting there in the front yard, but I'm doing this. And he got convicted, and this last week he put that down, and he had the opportunity to engage some people of a different ethnicity and have a significant conversation with them. What am I saying? I'm saying if we're going to love our neighbors, it takes priority and it takes intentionality. We have to say no to some other things, but then we also have to be looking on the lookout for opportunity. What we've got to do is learn to practice the art of elimination. All of us have lots of opportunities for activity. Most of us, our plates are full, we're stretched thin, there's, there's no time to go deep. But look at the example of the Savior. Jesus was never in a hurry. Much as he had to accomplish in the three years he had of ministry on this earth, he was never in a hurry. He didn't act like he needed to get more done. He had a very healthy rhythm. He, he focused on what matters. Look back in, in Mark. You don't have to turn. I'm just going to tell you. Look back in Mark chapter 1, verses 36 through 38. The disciples come for Jesus. He's been spending some time in, in solitude. They come and said, hey, people are looking for you. And Jesus' response was, hey, we need to go. 
somewhere else because I came to preach the gospel. What was happening? People were looking for Jesus because they wanted to see another miracle. They wanted him to do something for them. That's not primarily why he came. The miracles, the healings were only to validate the gospel message. Their priority was the message of the gospel. And so when the disciples came and said, hey, people are looking everywhere for you. You're very popular. They want to they see you. They want to they be around you. He said, you know what? We need to go somewhere else because I came to preach the gospel. Jesus had a very healthy rhythm and a healthy balance of what was priority in life and ministry. Now, let me speak to one particular group that's here today, and I want to tell you the group that's going to have the greatest difficulty having a healthy rhythm are those who have kids at home because there are endless possibilities for involvement. But what if your family decided teaching and obeying the great commandment with your family, with your children, what if you decided that was a priority? What if you said to your children, hey, we're going to be a a great commandment, great commission family. That would mean you have to decide the level of activity for each of your children. How many many sports we're going to play, what what level we're going to play at. That would mean you would ask yourself as parents the question, is it more important that my child be a great ball player or that my child understand and live out the great commandment? It would mean that you as a family are deciding, making decisions about how you spend time. You're making those decisions with eternity in mind. And I'm not saying just eternity in mind for the neighbors who need to know Christ and be prepared for eternity. I'm saying you're thinking about eternity, having eternity in mind, thinking about your own lives and understanding that when your son or daughter gets to heaven, Jesus is not going to say, wow, you were a great third baseman. Wow, you were an incredible captain of your volleyball team. That's not going to be part of what happens in eternity. I'm not telling you, I'm not trying to tell you how to raise your child. I did not raise mine perfectly. I'm just saying you have to at least evaluate If God is calling you and your family to do more in loving your neighbor and in helping your children understand their calling as Christ followers through meddling. But if you want some more, call me. Jesus asked Martha to say no to something that was good, ministering and serving him. Because saying no to the good meant that she could center her life around the main thing, the the best thing. And for us, that may mean we have to slow down. You see, it's easy for us to justify ourselves and, and justify our activity and why we have to do all these things and why we don't have time to engage those around us. But God calls us to lean into loving him and loving our neighbor. That means we've got to, got to think about our priorities with regard to how we use our time. You know, whenever I think about eternity and, and, and my mind is on life in light of eternity, there are two verses that always come to mind for me. The first is Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. It's a prayer of Moses where he asks God, teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. God, help us recognize how short our days are so that we use those days wisely in the manner that you want us to use them. And then the second passage that always comes to my mind is Ephesians 5, 15, and 16, where where Paul writes these words, be careful how you walk, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Listen, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We, we've got to grasp our limitations. We've got to recognize that, that our days are numbered, our hours are limited. One day we're going to stand before God and give accountability. And so we want to be careful how we prioritize the time that we spend on this earth. You ever thought about Ever wonder how you spend your time? You know, you can Google. There are a lot of studies out there on the Internet about how people actually spend their time. I, I found one, and, and most, of, most of the others are pretty similar to this one. The average lifespan in America today is 78.6 years, a little bit longer for women, a little bit shorter uh, for men. If you've got 78.6 years, you'll spend 25 of those years, this is the average person, 25 of those years sleeping. of those years working, 3.7 of those years eating 35 tons of food. Some more, some less. 
4.3 years driving, 3.6 years cooking and cleaning, if you're a TV person, 9.1 years watching TV, and of that 9.1 years, two years is commercials. <laughs> Listen, you got to fast forward. You're, you're wasting two years of your life watching commercials and then spending money on things you don't need to spend money on. One year deciding what to wear, year and a half fixing your hair. I'm not going to read this whole list, but let me just read this last one just because I think it's very interesting. If you live 78.6 years, you'll spend 14 days of your life kissing. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't write the study. Here's the bottom line. The average person has six hours of discretionary time every day. Obviously more without kids. I shouldn't say this because they're probably up in the venue listening. We, we had our four uh, grandkids, Sarah's kids, here this week with us. Just the kids, not the parents. God bless you people raising children today. <laughs> We're worn out. I was talking to someone this morning about how God gave children to, to young people. I can't figure out the Abraham and Sarah thing, being 100 years old and having a kid. I'm just going to tell you, I, I can't help you with that theologically. I, I don't know. Six hours discretionary time, more without kids, more if you're retired, more if you're, you're not working. But the bottom line is for all of us, our time is limited. And when time is limited, we've got to prioritize how we spend the time. And I would suggest that a really good priority would be to focus on what Jesus says is important. He said all the law could be summed up in love God and love your neighbor. So let me give you some keys this morning very, very simply and very quickly. And if you're taking notes, four things you can jot down here. Key number one is decide on the main thing. Decide on the main thing and keep the main thing the main thing. Prioritize and focus on what's the main thing. And very simply, Jesus said it's love God and love your neighbor. Your love for God should flow into your love for neighbor. Secondly, practice the art of elimination. What do you need to eliminate? Well, anything that steals time. This unessential. That may be TV, internet, social media, not necessarily evil, can be evil, not necessarily evil, but it's not very purposeful. It doesn't help meet your objective or what you have prioritized. Third, you need to be interruptible. What does that mean? You've got to have margin and flexibility. Listen, I can fill my days in the office here with things to do, but I always have to be prepared to be interrupted by a crisis, by a, by a funeral, by a, a, someone who's got an issue in the hospital, wh whatever. I've got to have margin. I've got to have flexibility, and you need that in your time too. You're not going to have space to love your neighbor if you don't create margin. Number four, you need to ask this question. When you think about all the things in your life and all the things that you do and all the things your family's involved in, you need to ask this question. Will it last? If you search through scripture, you will find there are four things that will last for eternity. The first thing, scripture is very clear, is that the word of God lasts for all of eternity. Matthew 24. Heaven and earth will pass away, God says, but my words will never pass away. Anything you do to invest the word of God in your heart and your life is going to go with you into eternity. Second thing, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 8, godly character lasts for eternity. Everything you do to become more godly in your walk with Christ is going to go with you into eternity. Third thing that the Bible says, and it's only these three things that scripture says last for eternity. The third thing is this, the souls of men. John 5, verse 29 says, everyone, everyone, all those who have already died and been buried, everyone will be raised to either eternal life or eternal damnation, suffering. You want to invest in your own future? Invest in the souls of men. Here's a question this morning. You've got to picture this in, in your own mind and, and picture your neighborhood. If you were a great neighbor, what would that look like? If you wanted to be a great neighbor, what, what would be the steps that you need to take? What would you schedule? What would you plan in order to be a great neighbor? Several years ago, National Geographic 
ran a story about the great land rushes of Oklahoma. You, you may have seen this uh, pictured in a movie or something where you see all the wagons lined up, a vast prairie in front and all the wagons and families and horses lined up waiting on the starter's gun. And when the starter's gun went off, they race out across the prairie from that starting line. And, and what they're trying to do is be the first one to get to a, a parcel of land, typically about 160 acres, and stake their claim on that land. And in this article in National Geographic, they had pictures of the homesteaders. And it was two different groups. One group looked very hollow, very gaunt. There was basically no life in their eyes, no smile on their faces. Another group, their eyes were lit. There were smiles on their faces. Totally different. And, and you might ask the question, when you look at these two groups, why was one group so gaunt and hollow, the other so cheerful and, and smiling? The gaunt ones had no interaction with their neighbors. When they staked out their, their 160 acres, they built their home right in the middle. So they didn't have fellowship. They didn't have support of, of, of close friends and neighbors. They went through those broiling, hot Oklahoma summers and those freezing winters alone. It was a tough life. The cheerful, smiling pioneers had decided that living in the middle of their acreage was too lonesome, so they moved to the corners. And by living in the corners, by by living on the edge of their boundary, they were closer to their neighbors, and so they fellowship with their neighbors. They shared burdens with their neighbors. They even worship with their neighbors. What, what happened? They realized they needed each other. Listen, you probably live around people who don't know that they need neighbors. And so you and I have to make the decision to move toward our neighbors. Your neighbors may be like those people who built in the, in the middle of the homestead. They didn't they isolated themselves. Maybe your neighbors don't even want interaction, but as we move toward them and engage them, maybe they'll become aware of their need, of the necessity, and maybe they'll move toward us. Well, what are the applications this week? The first is just to do what Mary did, to sit at Jesus' feet, to be still, to listen Ask the question, what do you want me to do? But then sit still and listen and wait for the answer. Maybe an action step this week is to audit your calendar and specifically your family calendar. And in that audit of your calendar to focus on the neighborhood and ask the question, what can I do to add gospel value this week to my neighborhood? doesn't mean you got to go door to door, knocking on doors and sharing the gospel or passing out tracts, but, but gospel value can just be what can I do to love my neighbors to make them open to the possibility of the message of the gospel. Maybe it's just praying for one neighbor, praying for one opportunity. I love what Casey shared last week about praying for this neighbor who was in the, the middle of their homestead. They were closed off. And yet when he prayed for opportunity, that neighbor suddenly was open. The opportunity was there. Maybe this week it's, it's just saying, hey, I'm going to take one small step. You know what a small step is? It's, it's very simply finding a simple way to engage your neighbor. It may be that you go over to your neighbors and say, man, your grass looks great. What, what have you done? Just engaging in, in some small way. Why do we neighbor? Because Jesus is our model. And, and lo, let me clarify when we talk about neighboring. Our, our objective is to love people. That's the objective. A likely outcome is that we'll get to share the gospel message. And we have to balance those two things. If you're just loving your neighbor to get to the opportunity to share the gospel or throw a track at him or invite him to church, and that's all it's about, they're going to realize they're just a project. They're, you're, they're just on your checklist. 
No, your objective simply is to love your neighbor and to keep loving your neighbor whether your neighbor ever responds to the gospel. Jesus loved people that didn't respond to him and he kept loving them. So the objective is, that the balance is, we're going to love our neighbor, but at the same time, as we love our neighbor, we're not going to postpone the opportunity to share the gospel. We're not going to say to ourselves, well, if I really love them well, they'll, they'll figure it out. No, if the opportunity comes to share the gospel, then that's what we do. We're going to love them and, and hope for the outcome and pray for the outcome to be able to share the gospel with them. We come to a point at the end of every service that we call the response time. And I, I want to take just a minute this morning and talk about response, both here and in the venue as well. What's the purpose of responding? Well, anytime we gather, anytime we're here listening to the Word of God, the, the whole service from the music, from, from the time in the Word, the whole service builds and prepares for a response. What does that mean? Can you respond right where you're seated? You sure can. Every week, God deals with people all over this room and in the venue right where they're seated. But something we've gotten away from for the last year that I want to reintroduce to our time of worship and specifically our response time is the opportunity for public response. You may hear me at times refer to the altar. The altar is just this area in front of the platform here up in the venue. It's the same it's the area up in front of the platform. There's nothing, nothing magical or mystical about this space. But there's something about times in our life where we need to respond in a public way. In the Old Testament, sacrificial worship, the altar was the place where offerings were made to the Lord. The, off, the, the altar was the place where sacrifices were made to the Lord. Sometimes it's important for us not to just sit in our seat and, and do business with God. That is important. But sometimes it's more important, more vital that we come publicly, not publicly for the people, but publicly before the Lord, we come to this place and respond to what he said. You know, when, when the gospel message is proclaimed, there's two basic responses that ought to happen. We ought to either be receiving it or releasing it. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're here this morning, you may have come with mom, and, and maybe you haven't been in church in a long time. You may come to church every week. If you're here this morning, and you've never responded to the message of the gospel, you need to receive it. That's why you're here. That's why God brought you to this place. What is the message of the gospel? Paul in 1 Corinthians said very simply, very succinctly, the message of the gospel is this, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried but that he rose again. Jesus rose again. Jesus is alive today. No other God can make that proclamation. Only Jesus lives as the true and living God. And why is that important? Because if he died for your sin, you have to understand he has victory over sin and death in the grave. And just as he was risen to life, you don't have to die in your sin and spend eternity in a place called hell, a very real place. Because Jesus died for your sin, if you commit your life to him, you receive his payment for your sin, and you commit your life to him as Lord, you too will be resurrected to eternal life. That's the message of the gospel. And if you've never responded to that message before, please don't think you're here this morning because your mom asked you to come and you know that's a good thing to do on Mother's Day. You're here this morning because God brought you to this place to hear the message of the gospel. The reason we're a as a church talking about neighboring is we recognize it is important to get out the message of the gospel because a time is coming when this world is going to be over, it's all going to be said and done, and God is going to destroy the earth and God is going to judge all those who have not received his son as Lord of life. So if you're here this morning and you've never received the message of the gospel, that's why you're here. But listen, many of you here this morning have received the message of the gospel. You're here because your job, your responsibility, your response to the message of the gospel is to release it. You're an agent of God to get the message of the gospel to your neighbors, to your part of the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means in just a few moments, some of you will need to come forward, and we'll do it while heads are bowed. You don't have to worry about the intimidation. We're going to have two pastors here on the front rows. Some of you need to come forward and just say to these pastors, 
hey, I need to respond to the message of the gospel. They're not going to force you. They're not going to twist your arm. They're just going to explain to you what it means to respond to Christ's claim on your life. Many of you this morning need to publicly come and kneel at this altar, you and the Lord, and pray for your neighbors. Now, why do you need to do it here? Because coming to the altar is an offering and a sacrifice. You need to offer yourself to the Lord. Lord, I'm willing to do. I'm I'm scared to death, but I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do to love my neighbor. Some of you need to come this morning to make sacrifice. Lord, I recognize that I put a lot of things before loving you, and I put a lot of things before loving my neighbor, and this morning I'm giving those things to you. We haven't allowed people to come forward for over a year we haven't allowed this altar to be open for over a year listen we're past that we're going to respond to the message of the gospel and I'm going to ask you to do something many of you have not been comfortable doing even before the previous year and that is to come publicly see that gives you some accountability that doesn't mean that when you get up from here you go back to your seat and you go what would you go down there for No, but hopefully if they're committed Christ followers, they're going to be praying, God, I don't know what Bob just did or what Susan just did, but God, I pray you'd help them follow through on their commitment. We're going to respond. In the venue, Pastor Curtis is going to uh, give you instruction on how to respond. But from today forward, when we call for response, we're calling for public, committed response that we will obey. We will sacrifice. We will offer ourselves continually to the Lord as living sacrifices.